Hello, my dear students. Uh, today, I'm going to speak to you on growth. Growth is an essential phenomenon uh, in childhood, and it is an important topic in pediatrics. Growth is an essential feature that distinguishes a child from an adult. When we speak of physical growth, we speak of children. In adults, we don't usually speak of growth. Growth takes place from the time of conception up to about 18 to 20 years. That is why uh, we call individuals below the age of 18 or 20 as children. And it is the definition of childhood as well. Right? So in pediatrics, we speak of infancy, toddler, preschool age, school age, then adolescence, and then child, adult. So up to 18 years, or even sometimes 20 years, we call them as adolescents. In the early embryonic period, there is exponential increase in the number of cells and differentiation of cells into organ systems. That is what you learn in embryology. Thereafter, the size of the cells increase rather than the number, and the protein is to DNA ratio increases. What does that mean? Uh, that means the nucleic acid, uh, the nucleic acid or the chromosome's DNA number or the amount doesn't change, but, but the protein, the size of the cell increases. So the number of cell after a certain period, the number of cell is static, but the size and the maturity changes. And after this static equilibrium, the aging cells are then replaced. Now growth and development are closely related as factors influencing one will affect the other. And growth and development can be equated to quality and quantity. Sorry, quantity and quality. So uh, quantity is the increase in the number and size and development, quality is the maturity and function. So importance of growth monitoring. Why do we have to monitor growth? Uh, annually, it is estimated that three to five million deaths occur in the world due to illnesses related to undernutrition. Therefore, we, in order to identify the growth faltering early and to investigate and do proper in interventions, we have to monitor the growth of children. Similarly, we have to identify children who are at a risk of overweight and obesity. It is also equally important. And also to know the pattern of individual uh, children. That also is an important factor why we should monitor. Because whatever said and done, each of us are different individuals and each will show a, a different pattern in their growth. So this is the state of Sri Lanka's children uh, in a recent study. Um, so this study says Sri Lanka ranks 68th of 180 countries as a, in the Child Flourishing Index. This is an index, uh, index which includes uh, child education, health, nutrition, and so many other things, uh, which shows the child is doing well. And, while, and in this study, they say um, they're actually using it as a proxy uh, to track the CO2 emission or greenhouse gas emission. So to say if the child flourishing index is high, that means the risk of greenhouse emission or pollution is less, right? So to reach the actual target, the ideal target, we need to work more. Or we have to look after our children better, right? So that's what it really means. Okay, let's see the factors which affect growth in the fetal period. Now, how do we know, how can we assess the growth in the fetal period? By measuring or assessing the growth the birth weight. A birth weight is determined by genetic and environmental factors. So they say about 40% is affected uh, due to genetic factors and 60% environmental. What are the genetic factors? Uh, Parental, parental characters, so tall parents, short parents will give rise to similar children. So they can't be contrastingly different. So parental characteristics or genetics play a role. Then the sex of the child, boy babies are found to be heavier than girl babies on average. Then the hormones, 
So thyroxine and insulin are the two main hormones which affect the growth in fetal period. Um, and fetal period, we must remember that the maternal thyroxine plays a bigger role. And the fetus starts producing its own thyroxine from the 12th week. Um, so maternal hypothyroidism is going to affect the baby's weight um, in an adverse manner, this hypothyroidism. And um, the child, even though he doesn't have a gland, he may be normal even at birth because after the matter because the maternal thyroxine is adequate to maintain the gestation and to produce a healthy baby so it becomes very important when we are speaking about congenital hypothyroidism then glucocorticoids influence maturation of lungs liver and the gastrointestinal system um, so you know you remember we use glucocorticoids to induce maturity of the lungs in preterm babies. If we expect a preterm delivery, we do give dexamethasone to the mother. Then growth hormone is not, not known to affect the birth weight that much. So even a child who, he, who is growth hormone deficient may show or shows a good birth weight. Right. Then fetal growth factors. You would have heard, remember, you would remember growth factors produced in the babies or in humans, insulin-like growth factor, one and two, transformation growth factor, alpha and beta, fibroblast growth factors, etc. So the fetus produces these growth factors and grows itself, right? In placental function and size, you would have studied uh, in the obstetrics and gynecology about the size of the placenta and the size of the infant or the fetus or the child. Vega, right? Then maternal nutrition, maternal factors, maternal nutrition, age, anemia. Uh, so maternal nutrition, if she's mother is poorly nourished, that will affect the baby. Age, the extremes of age, a very young mother or a very old mother may produce a smaller baby. Anemia, so anemia, uh, the high hemoglobin is very important to carry the oxygen from the mother's lung to the placenta. So if mother is anemic, the baby also is at risk of getting hypoxia. Drugs, um, smoking, illnesses, right? So all these things will influence intrauterine infections. So maternal infections, the torch infections we speak of. So these things will affect the baby's growth. 